hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. OK, thanks. I was not a successful undergraduate, and I finished college by the skin of my teeth in 1968. In the midst of my struggles, I thought about leaving school for a while, but this meant exposing myself to the draft and a tour in Vietnam, a prospect that confused and frightened me. I considered it honorable to fight and die, if necessary, for my country, but I couldn't see just how the national interest was at stake in this particular war. Indeed, I couldn't see the national interest at all. Many people were in favor of fighting the war, and it was clearly in their interest that it be fought, if not by them, then by others for them. But many others were opposed to the war, and it was just as clearly not in their interest that it be fought by themselves or anyone else. We had a political process to decide whether or not wars were going to be fought, but there too decisions seemed to be taken in the interests of some but not of others in a way that everybody seemed to accept, at least until that moment. But I could see even then that saying that the government of the day had duly decided to fight the war was not the same as saying that the national interest required it. The national interest, whatever it was, was nowhere to be seen until the fighting and dying began when it was vaguely invoked to justify it all. Several years later, having failed a draft physical, I found myself back in school at Penn trying to figure out what law, economics, and government had to do with one another. In my second year, in the space of three weeks, I read Ronald Coase, John Rawls, James Buchanan, and Gordon Tullock and I had a series of eureka moments that led me to glimpse how one could actually begin to think about all of these things together. I was especially captivated by the protean idea of social contract that linked all these writers to John Locke and the American constitutionalists. And the most exciting of these moments occurred when I read the opening pages of Buchanan and Tullock's Calculus of Consent, which had been written in 1962. They were about just the question that had perplexed me since college, and they seemed to have been written just so that I would someday read them and learn how to ask it. What is the state, Buchanan and Tullock asked, how should it be conceived? Not, they said, as an organic super-individual being, as some German philosophers thought, despite the attractive notion that if the state were such a social organism, it clearly could have interests and purposes. But if the state wasn't a collective being, they went on, it could not have interests of its own. In the end, the state's interest would always be determined by the interests of individuals mediated by some decision-making procedure. If so, they said, now I quote, we're left with a purely individualist conception of the collectivity. Collective action is viewed as the action of individuals when they choose to accomplish purposes collectively rather than individually, and the government is seen as nothing more than the set of processes, the machine, which allows such collective action to take place. This approach makes the state into something that is constructed by men." End of quote. These were liberating, intoxicating words for me. As I dimly perceived years before, there was no national interest. There were only individuals, <clears throat> their complex, contradictory interests, and a constitutionally governed political process that transformed these interests into decisions and policies that might well lack any purpose or logic beyond their ability to command a legislative majority or the enthusiasm of a powerful executive, and thus the mantle of legitimacy at the moment they were made. To oppose a war made legitimate by such a process was not to betray the interests of the nation, but simply to conclude that the fallible human officials whose interactions comprised the machine of government had used it to produce a bad set of decisions. But this just led to more questions. <clears throat> if the state had no interests, was there a state at all? How should we conceive it? In the end, Buchanan and Tullock never really say. Like Locke, they show how rational individuals could agree to empower certain of their fellow citizens, the government, 
to act coercively against them in the future with no appeal to interests beyond their own. There is, as Buchanan and Tullock say, nothing mystical about this. But then where and what is the state? And how is it different from the government? The passage I've just read conflates the two and intimates that they're one and the same. But what Buchanan and Tullock and Locke actually describe as constructed by men is not the state, but the institutions of government that empower fallible individuals to exercise coercive power in the name of the state or the people. This leaves the state itself in limbo or defined away. Yet for many people, even social contractarians like me, states are not fictions or shadows, but real social objects, and the institutions of day-to-day -day government do not fill the entire space mapped out by the idea of a state. The residual is whatever lends legitimacy and moral authority to the decisions and acts of the fallible governors if they are taken according to the procedures set out in the Constitution to which everyone has consented. And about this there is indeed something that, if not mystical, still has the power to inspire loyalty and sacrifice in free men and women. It's not the rules themselves, as Buchanan himself thought, it's the element of consent, explicit or implied, that makes the contract binding on the contractors and legitimates the actions of the people empowered to act under its rules. In a contractarian world, the state as such lies precisely in the agreement of the contractors to the terms of the constitutional contract, and its majesty, even to those who mistrust or fear it, is measured by the extent and consequence of the coercive powers that the contract grants the government and the circumstances in which they're deployed. Real states, what we mean when we talk about the United States prosecuting a war, have no interests or purposes distinguishable from those of their human constituents, but they're no less real for that. At the end of World War I, the American essayist Randolph Bourne observed the contempt with which free people treat the government of the day and their reverence for the state that lingers behind it and argued that the liberating achievement of industrial society had been to suppress the state in the consciousness of individuals and replace it with the government, allowing them to break free of the herd and live the lives they choose. But the moment war is declared, Bourne lamented, excuse me, these same people allow themselves to be regimented, coerced, deranged, and turned into a solid manufactory of destruction. The citizen throws off his contempt and indifference to government, <clears throat> identifies himself with its purposes, revives all his military memories and symbols, and the state once more walks an august presence through the imaginations of men. Buchanan called contractarian theories of government politics without romance, and his work has played an important part in keeping the state at bay in the consciousness of free men and women. I've applauded this general endeavor my entire adult life, and its impact is all around us, though not entirely as I, and probably Buchanan, might have hoped. Government is indeed treated with contempt in most quarters, and apart from the endless wars against seemingly inexhaustible enemies of the nation, the state has largely been demystified. But with this has come a diminution in the, in the government's legitimacy, a loosening of the people's sense of consent to the contract that has transformed American politics for the worse and led many people to look with hostile distrust at anything government attempts to do. If we're to have free government at all, something must fill the gap left by the retreat of the state.